from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell, I'm at home in London. We've got Easter weekend coming up, but it is a big weekend in the Mitchell family because it's my dad's 80th birthday. So we've got a lot of celebrations planned for him. Can't wait to help him feel very special. Lovely. Yes. Lots of candles to blow out there, Ali. Jim Maxwell for the, <laughs> the ABC here in Sydney. We're getting to the end of the cricket season. As the last gasp the other day, Western Australia had their third successive win in the Sheffield Shield. So uh, another big season for the boys from the West. Can they get more players in the Australian team from here on? We'll see. Alison, do please wish your father and on behalf of all of us, I suppose, on Stump. So congratulations. 18th is a I very special do. one. Thank you. I'm Charu <laughs> Sharma. Thank you. In Dubai, uh, although the IPL, unlike your season, uh, Jim, is only getting started. And how? <laughs> Sunrisers Hyderabad, 277, <laughs> the highest ever in the IPL. Gosh, was it a run feast. And am I almost, well, threatened to get there? What a match and a half. 523, all sorts of records were broken. And I suppose if uh, the matches before this hadn't lit up the IPL, this one certainly did. Yeah, it was amazing, wasn't it? Well, Charu, we'll come to the IPL, but uh, later on in the show, we're going to be heading to the middle and we're going to speak to international umpire Murray Erasmus to look back on his career and some of the controversial moments that he was involved in because he's now retired as an international umpire. But yes, first on the IPL, well, it's in full swing now, isn't it? And Charu... Give us a feel, you know, a sense of the tournament as it is now in its 17th season. Because we, you've just mentioned this record-breaking game, but sort of in the lead-up, like a few big names had pulled out, um, thinking Australia's Adam Zampa and England's Mark Wood pulled out of the tournament. And, you know, it started with a with a bang, you know, the glitz and the glamour. And then you just thought, oh, players pulling out. Like, it, does the tournament, you know, still have what it's always had? Do you think this record-breaking game has sort of given it a boost? Did it even need it? Well, you mentioned a couple of names that uh, are not participating, but all the rest of the big boys are. So uh, does the tournament still have what it had? Perhaps more than the past, uh, because it's, it's uh, rampaging all over India. The, the crowds are very heavy. The viewership is terrific. There's lots of runs being scored. You know, you do feel a bit for the bowlers, of course, every once in a while, but they too can star on odd occasions. A couple of new rules as well. So, yeah, I, mean, I think everybody's looking forward to another fantastic season. It was a tough one, mind you, Alison, because the Indian elections are around the corner. And as you know, the Indian election year clashes in terms of time with the IPL. But somehow, the management of the IPL, being somewhat close to the current dispensation, has managed to find a way out. And uh, there was a little bit of a delay in getting to the final date. But it's all done. It's all uh, arranged. And uh, the IPL is roaring ahead like some wildfire right now. But you mentioned the rule change, Cherry, for this year in the IPL, and that is that bowlers are now allowed to deliver two bounces per over instead of the usual one. So I'll get your thoughts about that in a moment. Let me just tell you what some of the players are saying, and Jim as well. Um, Dale Stain, who's the bowling coach for Sunrisers Hyderabad, uh, sorry, was in 2023 last season, he said on social media, the short ball tactic is already showing who can and who can't going to be a long IPL for some batters, he says. And we've had Rajasthan Royals seamer Sandeep Sharma saying that he likes the rule change. He reckons it puts the batter in two minds. But then South Africa's Tabre Shamsi says, is anyone going to think about helping the spinners out there too <laughs> with some sort of rule change? So that'd be a fun conversation to have. But look, it's early stages, isn't it? There are, those are some viewpoints. How do you think it's going down, Cherry? I do think, you know, you could argue it's only one more shorter ball than the past, but it's making a very big difference. It's certainly making the batsman guess a little more and, of course, stay on the back, but stay in the crease a lot more rather than attacking. Quite a few batsmen have already in these uh, past few matches been caught out and struck in the helmet because they've gone forward, not anticipating the short ball. And uh, luckily for them, they're all OK. Um, you know, there's no major concussion at this point of time. So is it just a shade more dangerous? Yes, it is. But that's what cricket's all about. Um, I, I do think uh, all the fast bowlers are using their option as much as is possible to the point where they're even going three and then getting called out for it uh, because the fast bowlers would love to bowl shorter deliveries. I think the batsmen are also sort of prepared for it. There are a lot more pulling and hooking and ramping going on. I think the ramp shot is the one that's uh, uh, going to be practiced by most because trying to pull the ball from outside the off stump, the short one, 
to leg is where they're getting caught out with the top edge or not quite getting uh, the right kind of uh, strength behind that shot. So the batsman will also quickly adapt to uh, this uh, two short balls and over rule. But I think the bowlers are loving it, that's for sure. <laughs> bowlers are always going to love it, Jim, aren't they? But you don't want the game to become too dangerous. Well, if that game overnight there's anything to go on, uh, the scoring rates are just going to in increase because bowling short's one thing, but you've got to do it well. Um, I mean, if you're giving the batsman a licence to throw his bat at it, and these bats today, top edge is enough to send it over the rope. Uh, small grounds. So it'd be no surprise to me if there aren't more runs scored because I don't think there are many seriously quick bowlers who can bowl the short ball as well as that. So... Uh, let's have a look and see how it plays out. Yes, it brings a bit more variety, allegedly, to the game, uh, but it might put the bowlers in uh, e even even more awkward circumstances if they're not good enough uh, to bowl the short ball that's going to worry the batsman. Because if you ain't quick, you're going to go out of the ground. Next on Stumped, we are joined by one of the men in the middle. After 18 years as an international umpire, South African Murray Erasmus has retired. Now, he stood in 82 tests, which has put him 10th on the list of umpires who've officiated the most tests in history. He's had his fair share of controversial moments overseen, like many, uh, but he has, well, experienced pretty much everything you can on a cricket field. And Murray is with us to look back on his career. Welcome to Stumped. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. Um, you know, we have to remind people, actually, that you were a player, weren't you, before you became an umpire? You played first-class cricket in South Africa. Um, began your umpiring career then in 2006. Take us back to that moment to begin with. Was it very important for you to stay in the game when you finished playing? Yes, it was, because we obviously very... Uh, I was very passionate about cricket. Um, but at the time, I was also teaching full-time and I was... Um, coaching and umpiring the matches of the teams that I coached. Um, so I had a taste um, of uh, either coaching and umpiring. So I had to make a decision which one will I follow. And the, the umpiring actually just fitted in better uh, for our lifestyle at the time. My kids were still quite young at the time. Um, and initially when you start, you do obviously only club cricket and it's only over the weekends and you can do your training um, whenever it suited um, our family life. Um, so, yeah, that was when I decided to join. Um, so that was around 2000 when I started with club cricket and then Cricket South Africa got to know that a former first-class player, there's another one in, you know, trying to um, make it as an umpire. And they gave me lots of opportunities, to, uh, invited me to cricket festivals. Um, so, you, so you can learn your craft. And then after about three years, I umpired my first first-class match and, and another three years later, my first international. Um, so there's obviously lots, lots of people who helped me to get there. So how different was it then going from being a player to then managing players and situations out in the middle? Um, I think you, you obviously grow as an umpire. Um, uh, so the, those skills come with time. I think I've, and I've said it many times, I'm, I think my previous um, career as a teacher uh, helped me a lot because you just you're dealing with just slightly bigger kids uh, on the international <laughs> cricket <group. Yep>. um, <laughs> and um, yeah the same the same uh, challenges and skills that you need uh, to diffuse those challenges um, i think yeah it's very relevant there so um, i found it easy and i think my calm personality uh, helped me um, you know to diffu uh, diffuse some of those moments why at 60 have you decided you've had enough? Is it, is it the travel that's wearing you down? It was basically the travel. Um, I've, I found in the last year that the time between matches, um, well, I just experienced it as dead time. Maybe because we've been to some of these venues so many times, we've seen all the attractions that it offers and, um, and uh, maybe I got spoiled in that, that sense. Um, but uh, during the Cricket World Cup, uh, my father actually turned 90. Uh, and there was obviously huge celebrations and I was actually the only family member not to be there. So um, having those thoughts for months leading into that time, um, I actually shortly uh, after that made the decision, I think this is right. And, and, and a small part of it, I wanted to make sure that I leave the game while I feel I'm still good enough to to be a good umpire at this, at this level. Um, so... That was basically a combination of those reasons. You were, of course, one of the two standing umpires for the World Cup final in 2019. Where does 
Where does that rank in terms of the matches and the drama that you've been around in international cricket? That game will, you know, stay forever as one of the best ever ODIs. Um, I think when you, when you're so focused in that moment as an umpire that only on reflection, maybe a day or two or a week later, then you actually realize the intensity of the situation. But we are so focused in that moment. Um, there was obviously the controversy of the overthrow and the incorrect awarding of six, where it should have been five, um, which we only got to know, obviously, on the Monday morning. But, yeah, uh, in most of those iconic matches, it's not um, at that time that you realize, you know, this is something special. It's only on the reflection that you do realize, yeah, that was that was it. wonderful. Can I take you back to Lords last summer during the Ashes? Because you were third umpire, weren't you, on one of the most talked about uh, hot Ashes issues of the whole series, which was the uh, Alex Carey uh, running out of uh, of Johnny Bairstow. Can you talk us through that from your perspective? For, for, for those who might not um, remember that occasion, uh, Bairstow let the ball go through to the keeper, didn't he? And then without looking back, uh, yes, scraped his toe on the crease, behind the crease, but wandered out of his crease. And Alex Carey, having just gathered the ball, immediately underarmed it back towards the stumps, hit the stumps. Bairstow was out of his ground and the Australians appealed. Can you talk us through that incident from your perspective? I'd love to have you know, been in the umpire's shoes and really understood everything that happened in that incident. Um, I've, I've got a layered reply um Go on. one is one is very clinical and then the obviously um from this uh, there's a, a debate f for about spirit of cricket whatever spirit of cricket is I mean, that's a debate in itself what is spirit of cricket but from my perspective on the day um the, the stumping he was stumped actually not run out because yeah, he wasn't sorry, yeah. um uh, i immediately asked uh, chris gaffney uh because uh, of the auto noble sometimes we don't see the live play as a tv umpire because i'm watching the screen to, to check the, uh, the the feet um and then i just double check with chris chris is it stumping is it run out uh, what are they appealing for um and our comms were cut to chris i got no um, uh, reply from him and then i asked our son um realizing that it is now uh, either a stumping or a run out situation if he called dead ball and he said, no, he didn't get that ball. So, so now I know, okay, the ball's alive because Kerry, and this is very important, immediately played the ball. And this takes me back to the Ian Bell run out in Nottingham in 2011, where I was actually mm -hmm. on field. And it, it, it takes you to any of the non-striking batsmen being run out by the bowler or even Angela Matthews timeout. In all of those situations, the umpires only apply law. And someone said to me shortly after the Angelo Matthews uh, timed out, Maria, we cannot transgress the spirit of cricket if we apply law. So from no. our perspective, it's it's quite cold. And we just said, yeah, ball's alive. Kerry played it immediately. Um, and therefore, Johnny is out. But now, obviously, the debate <laughs> starts. <laughs> but from our perspective, that was quite simple. And then the other debate is neutrality. If it was still COVID and all three umpires were English, I mean, it would have been a total mess. So, Murray, what was it like during the lunch break then at Lords? Because I was on the outfield at that point, trying to distill it all and make sense of it with the crowd baying behind me um, for the BBC's highlights programme. What, what then? Tell us then from your perspective what happened during lunch. Yeah, I quickly joined the, uh, the lunchroom because I, I, I do like my lunch. I uh, ordered my steak and um, the table of the umpires is in between the two teams at Lords oh. and uh, in walked uh, Johnny and obviously fuming and looked um, at the Australian table um, and then I realised, you know, something I might be witness here to something that I don't need to witness. And I mm. took my steak and I left the room. Oh, and then I subsequently <laughs> I heard that... Um, Johnny apparently said to them, are you happy with that? And Warner, David Warner replied, yes, sir, we are. So I think that was probably my best, best decision of that match, uh, not to stay and enjoy my lunch. As umpires, like, do, you, do you, you, know, you take your umpiring duties you know, off the field as well? If sort of something had you know, actually kind of kicked off in that situation, if you guys are the umpires, yes, you manage everything on the field, would you have a duty to step in and you know, you've still got that authority in the lunchroom? Yes, you, you would. I mean, I would have been witness 
to something. Um, <laughs> I think in the end it wasn't, uh, you know, something reportable, but uh, potentially it could have been. Yeah, you know, sometimes you do. Um, there's interactions in, uh, and sometimes in the change rooms and between disgruntled players and captains and officials. And yeah, so it's not just the the, the field of play. Uh, I remember Alex Hales stormed into the TV umpire's box at the Oval. Uh, I think Joel Wilson was the TV umpire and uh, complained about uh, not being enough cameras, to which Joel replied, I don't work for Sky. Murray, is there anything that's happened in the course of your career that you would really wish you could rewind the clock and go and do it again? Anything that, you know, sort of has niggled at you over the years? No, because I think in that moment, um, and I've, I've said this many times to, to when people ask, do you feel bad about when you get decisions wrong? No, because it, in that moment, it was my genuine, honest decision, uh, how I interpreted the information I had at the time. And sometimes you hear two noises and you think, oh, that must be a, a, you know, a bad pad, but it could be two pads. But at least there was some logic in why you got it wrong. Um, you heard the two noises. So that's how I always evaluated uh, my decisions um, and, you know, Sometimes there were ones, oh, I could have done better. Those those frustrated you. Um, but I think if you just give it in that moment, you know, so there's no there's no regrets. I mean, if you if you if you go back to the World Cup final um, and uh, subsequently, um, every time there's you know a throw from the boundary, you just keep it out uh, because that release time is so important. But at the time, we didn't focus that way on on throws from the boundary because you were focused on the stumps as they run out. Um, and subsequently, obviously, they changed the playing condition and now the TV umpire can check. So at least I can say myself and Kumar caused a rule change um, with mistake. Um, um, yeah, so no, no, no regrets uh, in the old career, um, even though there were some low moments, yeah. And you, Murray, were always pretty good at, you know, chatting to us in the media, whether it's sort of off record, you know, a little word before the start of a, a day's play or whatever. But do you think there'll come a time and would you support a time where umpires are mic'd up or we could actually interview umpires mid-match to explain decisions? I think they'll, there's definitely umpires that would be happy to do that. Um, maybe the ones that are more experienced, more confident, uh, maybe not initially when they, when they come on the scene. But I think we need to sell umpiring. And I sometimes a little frustrated with uh, ICC because they wanted to limit, um, you know, our exposure. And last year during the Ashes, when I went on on air to explain the Mitchell Stark catch, for instance, yes. we had so many positive uh, comments. Oh, you know, it's so important because we are the rugby guys, and um, I'm not sure about football, but we we can hear the rugby guys and they're yeah, giving the explanation. Tannoy. Yeah explanation for for their decisions and i think yeah um and maybe in the t20 game um you know the, that will work well maybe in test matches um the third or fourth umpire can do an interview maybe afterwards and right you've been such a huge part of the game over your 18 years internationally i, th I, th I think well i think i'll speak for many when i say we'll miss seeing you out on the field in test matches but enjoy your retirement and thanks for being with us on stumped thanks for having me it was a great journey well, that's all we've got time for on this week's Stumps. I'll say thanks to Chari Sharma and Jim Maxwell and to all of you. And we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.